So I want to talk about um, I want to talk about one of my open classes today, but um, I think it's sort of appropriate to give some background information first. Um, it would be disingenuous for me to say that I came to open easily or readily or as an ideologue. I came to it reluctantly. It was um, very much what I saw as, as being um, to the detriment of my, my previous incarnation, which is as, a, as an editorial photographer. So the last, um, the last 15 years I've, I've made a living as an editorial photographer. Um, and, I, and that business model um, involved me making images and then supplying them um, to magazines. You know, I now realize that my business model relied on people paying for the mode of distribution rather than the mode of information. But at, the, at the time, sort of, I don't know, what, 10 years in, this, this thought didn't sort of occur to me. What I saw was a, a business model that relied on my, my images being scarce, for me to charge scarcity prices. Um, but, and people would only get access to them by buying the magazines that they were packaged in. But as soon as my, mag my images were able to be um, found online, no one had to buy the packaging anymore. No one had to buy it, pay for the mode of distribution. So suddenly, um, my business model kind of collapsed. You know, people would buy the magazine, and I would get a kickback from that. When people see my images online, and I didn't get anything. So at this point, you know, I considered my product to be supplying images, and I thought that was all I did as a photographer. Um, but. I, I kind of came to this point where I had to sort of rethink that. Editorial photography, the sort of thing that I do, um, I would get paid $250 by the New York Times to photograph Jude Law. That's it. In, so there's no money to be made there for me. The only way I would make money is by syndicating these images. And, I, and as I say, I relied on this being a, a, a model of scarcity. So I would, have to, I would have to kind of keep these images scarce in order for me to keep charging these prices. So as I saw my images blossom online, I saw my images... Be, um, appear abundantly. I saw my revenues drop, and I saw my, my sort of economics 1.0 brain said, "So this is basic sort of supply and demand, you know. So there's an input supply of my images. So now I have to restrict this supply of images in order for me to keep the prices up. So I would actively police the internet. I would go online. I would find out where my images were, and I would tell these people, these bloggers, you know, take my images down. I would write out these vitriolic emails, and I would say, you know, would you steal the food from my children's plates? You know, would you sort of." break in and steal my car because that's effectively what you're doing by using my images for free. And I'd get the inevitable weepy email back from some 14-year-old girl in middle America who was devastated that she saw that I was apparently going to sue her and that, you know, oh, don't, please don't tell my parents and of course I'll take the images down, which, you know, I felt really bad about that. So I would now sort of say to them, I would say, you know, oh, so it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, just please put my name on there, leave a reference to my blog. I don't mind using the images, you're not selling them, that's fine. And, then, and she'd still be crying. So then I'd say, okay, well, I'll send you some extra stuff that no one else has got. I'll send you some outtakes, right? <laughs> this, is, this is my premium stuff. This is the stuff that I can, this is where I, the, the, you know, I really would normally make some money. But I'm giving this stuff away now just so that she doesn't tell her parents, because now I'm really worried about this. So, so what happened was, I mean, joking aside, what, then that is true, and that happened again and again. And I realized eventually that I couldn't police the entire internet. It just wasn't really an effective use of my time. What I noticed was that this girl, who was very much a part of her network of people that were into Heath Ledger, or whoever it was, would distribute these images and she would share them with her community who were most interested in Heath Ledger or Jude Law, whoever it was. And suddenly I would get this flurry of activity and this flurry of interest to my website. Now I didn't put this together. At the time, these are just, these are just random acts. But the point being, that this idea of scarcity uh, wasn't kind of working anymore. I couldn't control the, the supply of my images. You know, this is, uh, this is a real-time feed from Flickr, and I don't think anyone should look at it for more than sort of 20 seconds, otherwise people start to be ill. And if you're a photographer, then that will make you really ill, because that, they are images that are being supplied. We can't compete with that. So I photographed this guy called Corey Doctoro, and I'm sure you guys are much more familiar with him than I was at that time. But Corey's a science fiction author, for those that aren't familiar with him. And he was apparently making money from give, at the same time as giving his books away for free. And so I spoke to Corey and I said, you know, um, so Corey, we have a great deal in common. We both give our work away for free, but apparently you make money from it, whereas I clearly don't. So how, how, do, I, how do I get from where I am to where, where, where you are? And, um, and he was extremely generous. Um, as I, and this is, this is a story that re reoccurs with people that seem to sort of think this way. I hope now that I am also one of those people. But he's extremely generous, and he said to me, well, here's what we'll do. Um, we hatched a plan, 
whereby I would make up, I would make, I, I've actually gone into this in some detail um, in other places on my blog, and it was actually featured this as a case study by Creative Commons in the book they released in the summer, which is called The Power of Open. So if someone actually wants to read about that, then I think that's probably the appropriate place to read about it rather than here within these sort of tight 20 minutes. And um, what I did was, to cut a long story short, I made 125 prints or so. Uh, they're all exactly the same, and we, we versioned them out, what Chris Anderson's calls versioning in free, I'm sure you're familiar with it. So there was, number one was the most expensive, 150 odd pounds, and then these were scaled down to the last sort of 50 were five pounds each. And then there was the free version, which is here on Flickr, which anyone can download. This was a high-res version. Now at this point as well, you know, I said to this girl, this blogger, I said, you know, you can use my images, but please attribute it to me. Please send people back to me, and please, please don't charge people to access it. Now, my all rights reserved license at this point kind of means I can't do that. She was breaking a law. So that kind of became a bit clumsy and not appropriate for what, the way I now wanted to work. So Corey introduced me to Creative Commons. And so he also insisted that I use the freest of the CC licenses, which for, to me was anathema. The idea of giving my work away for free was completely wrong. And I had to explain to Corey at this point, you know, clearly, mate, this is not going to work. Um, you know, we're giving this away. So obviously I was proved wrong. And, you know, I now understand that economists refer to this as price discovery. I should have priced the most expensive one ten times higher because what happened was there was a fight over who got the most expensive one. These prints are all the same. The only difference is they're numbered. So um, they went with pages from the manuscript, which Corey signed. So I signed pages to the images, Corey signed the manuscript. And there was this fight for the most expensive, and all the expensive ones went, all the cheap ones went. There was a block in the middle that didn't go, but the point being that I made the traditional way of making money by syndicating the portraits of Corey, I hadn't made any money at all over the previous 24 months. This, I made two and a half thousand plus pounds over a much shorter period. Now, you have to check in with the actual figures on that, but the point being, this was a far better way of me making money for my business. The last thing I wanted to sort of mention with this before I get onto the class, this is something that um, I found when people talked about receiving a book from Cory Doctorow, right? You know, I, at the same time as this, I'd ordered a Flickr print-on-demand book, and I thought I was being pretty adventurous with this, as it sort of vomited through my front door and landed on the floor. I thought, you know, this is great, but I didn't feel very close to the, the publisher at that point. I hadn't put the money in her pocket, but I got my book. This is what someone got, this is what someone wrote when they got Cory's book, which is one of his books which, you know, was like printed in butterfly sweat and wrapped in sort of, you know, um, caterpillar wings or uh, whatever. Uh, on paper that came, actually came from the Ark, but he, he said, I have just experienced the anticipation, excitement, and fascination equivalents of a few Christmas mornings, a major birthday, and discovering the Victoria's Secrets catalogue all rolled into one. <laughs> if you've never believed book lingerie could be used in a sentence, read on about my experience unboxing a hand-bound, hand-finished copy of Cory Doctorow's With a Little Help. This is someone who just bought a book. This is clearly someone who's, um, you know, has, has bought in, bought into the product. So this kind of comes to me sort of three years ago when someone asked me if I'd write a class, um, write a photography class, uh, and I, 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 you know, hands up, I have no previous experience of lecturing or, or teaching, so I agreed to write this class. The class was called Picturing the Body, and um, and I, I was immediately assailed with sort of a couple of problems, which checking all the time. Um, the problems we had, this, this class on this course um, hadn't been advertised. There was very, it was the first time the class, this degree course had run. There were eight students in the year. And um, what they wanted, they came to me and they said, we want more people to talk about. We want more people to share our work and get feedback from. And they saw my work. They saw that I was teaching it. And they said, we, we also want these international opportunities. We want these sort of global, um, we want to be, to be working on a sort of global footing. So um, I, I didn't know how to solve this problem. So what I did was, I thought, well, you know, it kind of worked with Corey, so why don't I just open this out to the community? Why don't I remove the barriers to entry? So the barriers to entry were that people had to be in Coventry at the, at the course in order to take part, so let's remove that. So I put it on a blog online. And there are other barriers to entry, you know, expense, well, let's make it free so anyone can do it, which I did. And, and you know, also there's this sort of how people learn. You know, you have to learn in a certain way to be able to, um, to, to take a degree. Well. You know, well, let's that's, that's remove that barrier to entry as well, because uh, you know, there's clearly people have a great deal to offer. So I put it online, and, um, and a lot of people kind of turned up. In fact, um, 
I, 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 one day I get a call for, at, at the work and, and someone says, so Jonathan, how's that class going? I'm saying, yeah, it's going pretty well. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's small, but it's going pretty well. Right, so it's getting more server traffic than the rest of the department. And so I said, so, so, oh, that's, that's interesting. I'll look into that. And then the next week, you know, it crashed the servers because too many people turned up. And then I had to sort of put my hands up and say, you know, it turns out that I gave it away for free and I, I put the class online. So that didn't go down particularly well at the university because <laughs> they, were, they, they kind of saw their product in terms of, of knowledge. Now, I, I know this now. Um, just as I'd seen my product in terms of photographs, they saw their product in terms of knowledge. And if I give this knowledge away, then who's going to pay for an education, right? So at that point, um, edu education funding in the UK, or shortly afterwards, edu education funding changed in the UK, and people were looking for um, other people that were doing other things, other solutions, so that kind of works really well for me. So the second class came along, and I, I this time I did it with the, with the support of the university. I opened it out online, and it was called Photography and Narrative. But it, seemed, it didn't kind of seem the appropriate question to be asking for me, bearing in mind where I was at with the with my business model and, and so on. So I thought more, a more appropriate question is, what does it mean to be a 21st century photo practitioner? And I didn't have the answer to that. So how, did I go into, how am I going to teach that? that? That, again, seemed rather problematic because the book hasn't been written on it yet. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll kind of open it out and I'll ask people. I'll ask people to contribute. I'll ask people to come up with the appropriate questions because no one's going to have the answer. But maybe if they have the questions, then we can begin to explore that together. I didn't have any money, though. So this was, was a sort of another problem. But so I, what I said is, you know, you can maintain all, uh, ownership of, of anything you contribute, and we'll use this system, this platform, and, and anybody that comes to see it will go back to you. So I began to mediate the ownership of the class and mediate the authorship of the class. And then I, I began to um, realize that, in fact, in some instances, I didn't have actually have as much, I didn't have much to offer, certainly not as much in terms of the specialisms that the people were bringing to this class. And my role changed. You know, it became, it changed from being like this broadcast model of teaching and learning, where I would sort of broadcast the answers to people who sort of absorbed them, to someone who cur curated a journey between these people that I saw as being, as necessarily having a great deal to offer. So my role became to provide the contextual links between these individuals. Um, and you know, it, it kind of went. It kind of, it kind of went well. It's the second iteration um, right now, and, and the one class um, has more students than the entire university. In fact, over the last um, five weeks, we've had more people come to the class than NYU has undergraduate students. So, um, where was I with this then? That's a little. <coughs> So one of the things about this class that I began to sort of realize, and I don't want to sort of get too geeky now about photography. How am I doing for time? Um, you've got like 15 minutes. Good. Cool. <laughs> Can't much more to say. Um, so one of, one of the things that was important here about the, photography, about the photographer was that the, the photographer didn't consider themselves to simply be a supplier of content. What I proposed was that they, they began to consider themselves as a publisher. But the question was a publisher of what? And so what I said was, I think we have to consider ourselves to be publishers of hubs, where we mediate the authorship of the, of the project, where we mediate the ownership of the project, where we get people to take a vested interest in the project, the, the, the theme, the thing that we, we think is a story to be told. And it seemed appropriate at that point to point out that the class itself had become a hub. So um, what I had was, we had a distributed class that was taking place all over the world. These are the first 200 people to sign up to this, this um, the latest iteration, um, that, were, that were contributing their content. But, um, but they were doing it in sort of different places. Because I had no money, I didn't have any money to set up any platforms. You know, universities love to do this. I've noticed this sort of in my sort of brief tenure that um, the universities love to reinvent things. So I say, I say something, or one might say something like, oh, Flickr is really great for storing images. And so the university, the institutional answer to that is, let's build one like Flickr. Let's build a university sort of type Flickr. Or let's build um, a place for hosting sound. And this becomes incredibly expensive. And, and then also, you know, it's kind of, it didn't kind of work. What really worked for me was going where the fish were already swimming. You know, if, if students are already using Flickr to store their images, then why not let them use Flickr? Flickr is really good for storing images. And if they're using SoundCloud for storing sound, then let's, let's leave them there because that's free and it's constantly being updated. 
And the same thing with Vimeo. You know, Vimeo is great for video. Why would we try and build that and then have to pay the storage? So instead, what, I, what we do, the basis of the class is we consider these barriers to entry. So if people are already using those spaces, then just need to aggregate them. Just need to sort of bring them together. So um, about 18 months ago, a year ago, we, we built an app, which was a simple aggregator. So students can take part in these classes. They can dip in, they can dip out, they can take the whole class, they can take bits of it. Um, but they continue to produce work in the environments they already use. So if they're using Flickr, they carry on using that. If they're using Vimeo, they carry on using that. What the class does, what the hub does, is it aggregates all of these feeds. So this, this content is dispersed all over the internet. But the hub, the class, aggregates it into one place where it makes sense. This is the place where we can, it kind of comes back to, um, kind of comes back to the problem that was solved with the Cori Doctoro, the artifact, and, and if you saw in the, the generative experience, what Kevin Kelly refers to as the generative experience. I didn't get people to pay for that. You know, the, the university said, if you give all this away the, for free, then no one's going to pay for it. Well, my experience was, the more people talked about my images, the more people, um, it increased the value of the, of the perceived value of the analog experience. The more people saw the image, the more people wanted to own the original. You know, we, we, you know, this is a, a well-cited example. I think it's Anderson again who talked about the Mona Lisa. You know, the most, the most familiar image, the most copied image, which is infinitely expensive. In fact, it's uninsurable. So how do we sort of, how does this translate into a university experience? Well, it turns out that um, it turns out that that the, that um, the, the course is now the hardest to get into in the university. It's only in its fourth year. And um, um, so it turns out that, in fact, the more people hear about this, it actually increases the perceived value of this generative experience. People actually want to come and sit in the classroom. When 20,000 people came over the last five weeks to, to, to the class, when 10,000 people are waiting to start a class in January, the 30 people in the room suddenly have a pretty big platform. They have a lot of people looking in at what they're doing. They have a network which is established and global that they can tap into. And you know what? As someone that's really kind of struggling to find the answers to the questions that I'm posing, it's a, it's a, it's a, hell, of a hell of a resource for me. You know, the, when I first did this, Fred Ritchin, my hero, suddenly came along and started to, to, to feed me information because they wanted this to work. You know, Fred Ritchin, who wrote After Photography, he got involved and was, again, incredibly generous. Stephen Mays of Seven Agency and David Campbell. These people, these people who, photographically, you, you probably be aware of them. These are the people that are sort of defining this new vision, and um, they just came along and started to help me out. Richard Stallman wrote to me and said how excited he was about the project, which for me was sort of particularly emotional. So it, it nevertheless, it sort of presents this problem, because institutions have, the institution that I was now familiar with, had kind of had one product, you know? You come along and you buy a three-year degree. So how do you version, how do you version that? How do you spread it out so that you can have like one class, one day, one week, one workshop? How do you, how do you ch chop it up so people have different entry points? The other, um, I mean, we are sort of, we're sort of moving on, on with that and we're sort of doing exactly that at the moment. The other thing we're sort of working on at the minute is, um, is how to distribute these generative experiences, which I think is one of the most ex exciting sort of, um, exciting, well, it's the thing I'm most excited about right now. It's kind of, you know, this, this open kind of isn't enough which is kind of where, where I'm at now with this and the people that I'm working with. Um, the key is to sort of distribute this experience so that people can not only experience it, experience a generative version of it um, remotely, but they can also take ownership of it. And it moves from being a tweet up to being a slide slam where everyone gets together and shares images over a beer. You know, they have that analog one-on-one -on -one experience. And the next step is how do they validate that? which I think is sort of interesting. But this idea of open isn't enough. You know, um, we've been saying now for well, it's three, two, two, three years, you know, this is open. It's, it's licensed CC by, um, BY. You know, um, you can have this and you, you can use this. You can build on this, make it even better, contribute to, to, to what we're doing here, and, and we, we all win. But people are really reluctant to do that. And I think that most people still sort of think, you know, in, on, on one level, there's kind of stealing stuff. I mean, I would think this, and this is why I think this. So I don't think it's enough necessarily for people like me to just be um, passively open. And so what we're doing now is we're trying to be actively open. So we're now actively devising educators' packs so that you can, you can download the framework for phone art, for photography and narrative, and you can have that experience at your church group, at your primary school, at your 
secondary school, and you can use it on your degree, or maybe you can, you can change it and use it for your MA. Um, but I, again, you know, these, this, this is kind of where we're at right now, and I think um, that, that's the, the sort of the most exciting part. So I am, I'm not going to say anything else unless somebody wants me to. Hi. I have a question. It's, it's less to do with the technology, but okay, so you said up to like almost 20,000 people. So it's a photography class, and student, the students have to take pictures for this class, right? They have to do a bunch of different things. Yes, yeah, so 20, over 20,000 people have, have come to the visitors have come to the class site over the last five weeks. Yeah. Yeah, and so all the material is online. There are tasks online that people will do each week. Um, I, yeah, there are plenty of workshops. There are plenty of places where you can go and get online tutorials. But that sort of structured uh, program of learning with a start, middle, and end. We use, I mean, I sort of built, try to build in a lot of gaming dynamics where people sort of you know they, they level up, they get experience, they yeah. they get lots of rewards, they get lots of they get quick feedback. Yeah. Well, here's, here's what I'm thinking. It, it's okay. So you have like all these people, right? Yeah. And they have all these different levels of experience in photography. Mm -hmm. And you know, you could have somebody who only has a cell phone camera potentially taking this class, to so somebody maybe at your level who's taking this class. Yeah. So how do you reconcile all that and and you know get everybody to com you know I mean to a common ground, be able to you know, be able to teach people how to get the most out of the camera they have, and you know, so so not just the theory of it, but but to get to the technical aspects of the of the craft. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, well, you know, without getting too geeky about photography, there are the technical barrier to entry has been removed. Anyone, everyone's a photographer now. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't even begin to try to teach each um, technique. There are much better places to learn that. You go on YouTube. If you want to learn how to use your particular camera in multiple functions, then I would, well, actually what we do is we built a forum. And we said, here are questions that we get regularly asked. You know, do you have a great resource where you can learn how to use X or how to light Y? And people have, have um, contributed those places to go to that. But the thing, so that's easy. You know, when I look for photography students, I never look for people that are, that are gifted photographers. I look for people that have got something to say. You want a storyteller, you don't want a technician. The, the teaching people how to use a camera is easy. That's, yeah. But it's, um, so someone that's using a phone camera is, is equally as valuable, especially if they've got a great story to tell. More so in most cases. I think most people believe, um, I think uh, cell phone images for a start are much more believable than sort of, um, um, sort of high, highly produced images, if you will. So, does that make sense? Does that answer that? Or I just confuse the issue? That's how I teach. It's great. Uh, I mean, <laughs> well, I, I guess there's, I, I guess from my perspective, I mean, there's all different ways to teach. I mean, there's no right or wrong to teach a photography class, and I, and I agree with you about photography as a story. You know, but but to, you know, it's art, and you know, and so, you know, I'm I'm speaking from the perspective of somebody who's a two-dimensional artist. You know, uh, somebody who's an illustrator, uh, painters, you know, and there's you know, there, there's techniques you need to to enhance the story, For the sure. effects, and all that. You know, and so and so with the wide variety of cameras, the wide variety of expertise levels. Um, you know, it's like how you know how, for those people to get the maximum, I guess, out of the. Well, I guess people bring their own expectations to the class too. I mean, you know, I guess it depends on what they want to. Get out of it, you know, but. Yeah, one of the things is, is giving people feedback, mm -hmm. the right levels of feedback, if you will. So, and, and it's, it's physically impossible for I mean, working one day a week technically, although Matt, Matt Johnson and I, who's the guy that I work with in this, work seven days a week on it for the time zones as well. But um, you know, what we did is we, we, we tried to sort of facilitate environments where people could um, peer assess and mm -hmm. peer support each other, and we tried to encourage people to do that so they can give the right levels of, of support. So are you able to do like a, like an online critique or something like? Yeah, that's exactly what we yeah. do. Yeah. So hi. Hi. Um, I wonder if you say a little bit more about how things played out with commentary. So. Um, Is this being recorded? Um, <laughs> but um, I suppose what I'm interested in is how you know what kind of persuasion, uh, what kind of process did you go through, getting from what the hell are you do giving away our knowledge, to 
Okay, let's carry on and see how it goes. Um, I've been given the one finger, which is never a good thing. Um, so, <laughs> um, well, the answer is, you know, in truth, there was a moment of shock when I was used opened it a bit initially, but in truth my line manager is extremely supportive. He would be standing with me to here today if he weren't actually running the shop. So um, at that moment he saw, I mean he, he's, he has the same vision that our product is, is far more than simply knowledge. It is this generative learning experience. That's what our product is. So at that point when so many people are coming, when the course suddenly is the most, um, is the hardest one to get into in the university and it's second year, which he was at that point, and when we're now currently turning away more people than any other course within the university, at that point, one has to look at it and say, what are you doing differently? So at that point, mm -hmm. then they sort of said, okay, well, maybe this so, stuff... So it was really the fact that we had that interest, because if that interest hadn't been there, then I'd have bought the club. Um, well, yeah, either that or I would have carried on doing it anyway. I mean, you know, so um, I guess I mean, these, these are sort of con these are concrete um, outcomes, aren't they? 20,000 people? That, yeah, yeah. The, 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 you can't really argue with those stats. They're investment banker statistics, aren't they? Is that it? Thank you. Thanks.